You'll turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 9. You follow along as we read the first six verses of Proverbs chapter 9. Wisdom has built her house. She has set up its seven pillars. She has prepared her mead and her mixed wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her servants and she calls from the highest point of the city. Let all who are simple come to my house. To those who have no sense, she says, come eat my food and drink the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and you will live. Walk in the way of insight. Let's pray together. Fathers, we continue to read and to study your word. We ask, Lord, that you'll prepare our hearts, not just for today. Father, for hopefully the months to come as we study and in, intake your wisdom and think about it. And Lord, as you want to make us wise, wise in living, wise in doing, we ask, Father, that you'll lead and direct us in that path. Show us, Lord, your word and its ways. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Proverbs chapter 9, verses 1 through 6 is an invitation. We are getting an invitation. Solomon is, is, it's like he's inviting all the sons and daughters of Israel to come to this tremendous feast that's going to be prepared for them. Now, let me give you a great insight into scripture. Write this down. Chapter 10 of Proverbs follows chapter 9. You're not overly awed by that, are you? You should be. Look at chapter 10 of Proverbs. Do you notice anything different about chapter 9 and chapter 10 of Proverbs? We're into something entirely different. From chapter 10, verse 1, through chapter 22, verse 16, are 375 carefully selected Proverbs. Carefully arranged. You can't tell that in the translations we use, but it is carefully arranged. We'll be showing you that in the next, well, two or three months that we're studying this. That you're going to see that he has selected, well, the Bible tells us that Solomon wrote 3,000 Proverbs in his lifetime. To have selected out 375 means that he has put together for us a great banquet. Almost, uh, to use the term, a smorgasbord. It's arranged. There's arrangement there. But you can pick and choose. You can go through this and look at it. And you'll be able in the days ahead to gain God's wisdom in a variety of things. For instance, if you're trying to get ahead financially, there's wisdom for that. As you study this, you're going to be able to see, oh, that will help me here. Oh, that's a great insight there. And it's just like you're going down a big buffet and you're going to be able to pick and choose and to take and to understand what it is that you're getting and to appreciate it. Uh, we went yesterday to uh, Whole Foods uh, with Wes and he said, boy, that's, I've got sensory overload. There's just so much here. And he said, I've rarely seen a place where they have fresh octopus raw, you know, for you to buy. Well, a lot of people don't appreciate octopus and squid. I didn't at first because I'd never had it prepared properly. But when it's prepared properly, this is great stuff to eat. But there was a time I would have looked at that and said, I ain't eating that. When you're prepared for it, when you're able to understand what a proverb is saying, when you're able in its context to grasp that he is saying something much greater than this little two-line bit of wisdom, that he is opening up a world of information, you're able to take off of that and say, now I understand how this works and how this relates to godly dealing with finances. It will help me in that. You're trying to have success on the job. It will help you with that. If you're trying to raise children, trying to figure out how do you do this job of teaching children, of instructing them, you'll be able to gain wisdom in the following chapters. If your speech is holding you back, you don't talk well, maybe you don't say things right, you're going to be able to select carefully here and to understand how to change the way you speak. 
in order to change your life and to make things different in your life. Let us consider what wisdom has to offer to us. Chapter 9, verses 1 to 6 is the invitation, but it's an invitation to wisdom's banquet. Wisdom's banquet is coming in, verses, in chapters 10 to 22, but the description of what she has done, what she has prepared for us, is in chapter 8. That's how all this is going to tie together. Wisdom's banquet is filled with truth. That's in verses 6 through 11 of chapter 8. We have to decide whether we're going to choose to build our life on truth or lies. That seems kind of obvious. Which would you rather build your life on, truth or a lie? But you realize that many times lies masquerade as truth. They, in fact, have falsehoods. For instance, stolen water is sweet. Man, there's just something exciting But do you realize that expresses a lie? It sounds good, and you would have to say, yeah, you know, it's kind of, kind of, there's something exciting about stealing something. We discussed on Thursday night at the teacher's class about did you ever steal a watermelon? If you're out in the country, that was almost, in fact, there were some farmers that as long as, as Clyde said, you didn't step on the vines, they didn't mind you taking watermelon. And it's all like, oh, we're going to get one here. You know, this kind of thing. And there's certain excitement about it. But is it sweeter because you stole it? No, there's a lie associated with that. Sometimes it's a buckshot lie. (laughs) Mm. And you realize that I'm going to have to eat this watermelon standing up. (laughs) And a whole lot of things standing up for a while. There's a certain thrill to it. But there's bitterness in the end. Whose favor do you want in life, God or the godless? That's in verses 12 to 21. When we choose wisdom, we're choosing, note what it says, prudence and knowledge and discretion instead of recklessness, ignorance, and poor judgment. When you choose wisdom, you say, I am no longer going to love evil. I'm no longer going to cherish pride and arrogance, evil behavior. I'm not going to speak perversely or reward those who do. When you seek out wisdom, you're gaining counsel and sound judgment and understanding and power. That's the wisdom of God. This wisdom is the very wisdom that preceded the creation of the world. Look at verses 22 and 21. Verses 22 and 21 of chapter 8. He begins talking about, he's personifying wisdom. And wisdom, Lady Wisdom says this, The Lord brought me forth as the first of his works before his deeds of old. In other words, she's saying, I proceeded to creation. I was formed long ages ago at the very beginning when the world came to be. When there was no watery depths, I was given birth. When there were no springs overflowing with water and so on as she begins to describe the creation of the world. Wisdom is saying, I was there long before any of this was there. This is ancient wisdom. It is the knowledge that has come from a long time. Do you want what is currently popular? Or do you seek proven wisdom in your life? There's faddish wisdom. This is the current what everybody thinks. Everybody thinks this way. Now, if you've had teenagers... You know about faddish wisdom. Everybody's doing it. And you also know about truth and lie because you realize that not everybody is doing it. And you realize that it's not really wisdom. That the ancient wisdom, the wisdom upon which the world was created, is God's wisdom. It is the wisdom that He created. Do you want life and God's favor? For there is a great promise attached to finding wisdom, life, and favor from God, from the Lord. But when we ignore the invitation, we're harming ourselves. And we're saying, you know, I really love death. You will have the opportunity in the days to come to feast at God's table of wisdom. 
You're going to have access to the very wisdom that created the world around you. God is going to open the door and he's going to stretch your mind. So as you think about this, you're going to begin to recognize and begin thinking the very thoughts of God. The thoughts of God by which this world was made and put together and ordered and arranged. You're going to begin to understand not only how things in our inhabited world work, but how things in all of creation work. You're going to experience the wisdom that is designed to delight and benefit mankind. Notice down at the end of, uh, in chapter 8, verse 30, she says, Then I was constantly at his side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence. What was the delight? Seeing creation. Notice in verse 31, rejoicing in his whole world and delighting in mankind. What is wisdom saying? Wisdom says, I delight in people just like you. Do you realize that God in his wisdom wants to bless you? He takes great joy and great pride in seeing you and seeing you grow and seeing you learn and seeing you develop in wisdom. If you've had a child, you know that. You watch that child grow and become less stupid as the days go by. And you marvel at it. Wow, this is really wondrous. That's delight's attitude. That's the delight of wisdom. Wisdom is not against us. Wisdom is for us. Wisdom is not trying to keep us from something good. Wisdom is trying to keep us from being destroyed by something terrible and by something bad. I want us to take a moment now in chapter 9 to talk to parents. Parents have the responsibility to correct our children when they're doing wrong. We have a responsibility to work with our kids, to help our children, to say, look, you need to do what is right. We need to rebuke them when they fail to live up to righteous standards, when they do something which is wrong. We should not be ambiguous about right and wrong with our children. That's our responsibility. We have the role of doing that. Look what it says in chapter 9. Verse 7, whoever corrects a mocker invites insult, and whoever rebukes the wicked incurs abuse. Well, hey, that's our responsibility to do that. But there's a danger with that. Now, here's the point. Parents, sometimes you have to stop instructing your children based on their response. Let me give you two illustrations of that. It's bedtime. The room's a mess. You say, now we need to clean this room up before naps. And you have what in the vernacular is known as a meltdown. What do you do? Well, you keep beating on the child until they pick everything up, right? No. What do you do? You put them to bed. And then you clean the mess up. So it's all cleaned up and the child learns nothing, right? No, you put the child, if the child is truly in a meltdown situation, this little toddler, you put them to bed. Then when they get up, say, now let's clean up. Sometimes you have to stop. Sometimes you have to say, look, uh, we're going to take a break. I'm not a big believer in time out. I do believe children are like canoes. You steer them from the rear. But there's a time where you have to say, this is not going to work with this child right now. There may be a time when you have to let your teenager experience some of the consequences of their actions. And I recommend doing that earlier than later. In fact, I would recommend it with elementary age children. Where, okay, there's certain decisions you're going to make, or there's certain consequences that flow from that. Because there's a school from which we never graduate. It's called the school of hard knocks. And sometimes it takes hard knocks for hard heads. Sometimes you have to back off and say, okay, I told you to do this. And you may not be able to see this. I'm trying to get in light, but you'll get this response. It's 
It's called the eye roll. Or you may get a child that actually becomes very physically violent. They're out of control. Sometimes you have to say, okay, we'll stop and let, let it go. Till you learn, oh, that's not a good lesson. That's not. And the hard knocks can teach your child that kind of lesson. Remember, you're dealing with three kinds of children as we're working with this. Number one, you got everybody's favorite child, the wise kid. Not the wise guy, but the wise kid. This child loves to take in wisdom, loves to do what God says, loves to please you, enjoys that. You've also got the one we laugh at, the simple, the naive child. That, you know, they just, they're funny. Because of how they're just walking through life and, and they're not paying attention. We've got to wise them up. But you've also got the fool. And this is a child that's described here as a mocker. When he is comparing in verses 7 to 9, the best with the worst, the wise and the mocking child, he's saying this. Here's the characteristic of the mocking son. When you correct a mocking son for doing something wrong, that child turns around and insults their parents. Maybe verbally or non-verbally, but they are insulting the parents. He goes on to say, they are going to eventually abuse them by rebuking point for point your faults. And maybe even magnifying and making fun of your faults. And then you need to understand that they're going to come to the place where they hate you. Wow, that's tough. Don't you feel uplifted this morning? You know, sometimes wisdom is not uplifting, but sometimes wisdom is absolutely necessary to tell you this is how the pattern sometimes goes with children. One of the mistakes that we make as parents many times is we try to get the child to hate us, to love us by doing things for them. Rather than by recognizing this child is not ready for grace. They're not ready for the benefits and the gifts. This child's got to learn in school. The school of hard knocks. Our prayer and our hope for that child, for that mocker, is that God will shake them up. So they are ready to become the wise child. Notice that the wise son responds entirely different from the mocker. When you rebuke a wise child, what happens? They love you for it. They are delighted the fact that you said they were doing something wrong and they could do it better. Because they take that as constructive criticism. They recognize my parents love me enough to teach me right from wrong. To teach me this is the way to do it. This is not the way to do it. And you get the love of that child. You can tell I've got a wise child. They know their love. They're going to take that wisdom you pass on to them and they're going to become wiser still because they're going to take the teaching you gave and they're going to add to it what they already know is right. They're going to get wiser and wiser. They're not only going to take what you say, they're going to read in the Bible themselves and they're going to begin adding to their own wisdom. You're going to recognize, wow, my child is, is wiser than I am in many ways. They've really taken it to heart. They've really done that. And you're able to, to impart to them the very knowledge of God. Our prayer is always that we may be able to teach our children life as it ought to be lived. Sometimes, I admit, we have to say, I blew it. I wasn't living wise myself. Maybe when they get some of that rebuke, you recognize, hey, I'm not doing right myself. And that's the correction that comes in. The, uh, the thing I hate the most about my children is when they act like me. Because I can see it. And I know where they got it from. I know exactly where it came from. Good grief. Now, let me give you a quick word to the children. When you're doing the eye roll, or you're kind of listening with the flaps open on the inside, you know, where you've got the flaps down, where it goes in this ear, comes out this way, you lower those flaps and it just flies through. Be careful that you're not rejecting God's teachings in rejecting your parents' teachings. 
saying, I don't want to listen to that, I don't want to hear that. It may rub you the wrong way. It may not be what you want to hear, but you need to recognize God put my parents here to give me wisdom. God has put my parents, God has selected the people that are around me in order to shape my life for his glory. Dr. Howard Hendricks talks about his father. He said, my father had no desire ever to shape me for the ministry. In fact, his father was an unbeliever most of his life, a military man, as well as uh, in reserves, an officer in the reserve, but also a man who worked for a living, hanging paper and, and doing that kind of work. But he said he had no intention ever to prepare me for the ministry, but God used that man and his gift to prepare me for ministry. God has placed your parents in your life in order to help you learn the wisdom of God. God has given them to you to protect you so you get old enough to get wiser. Because wisdom is a thing of age, and if you die early because you're stupid, you don't grow a lot in wisdom. That's another one of those profound, simple truths. Long life has a great benefit. And you need to recognize that your response determines your reward or your suffering. Your response will determine your reward or suffering. Now, if you wind up in jail, it will break my heart. It'll break your parents' heart. But they won't be in jail. You'll be the one looking and wondering what the sky looks like and the green grass beyond. And marveling at those times when you get out in the exercise yard and you can look off and see trees in the distance. Why? Because you didn't love wisdom. You realize all of us are somewhere along the line of loving wisdom or loving folly. I turn now to wisdoms, from wisdom's banquets to follies, pitiful deception. Doesn't it look good? It's a place back home called Mass General Store. And one of the reasons we like to go there because it's a candy store. They got barrels and barrels of this stuff. Everything you could possibly imagine. It's just wonderful. And a lot of times when Folly puts forth her, her banquet, it looks like a candy store. And you're thinking, this is better than lima beans any day. This is a lot better than all that spinach and stuff. Folly has a wonderful looking banquet. She says, stolen water is sweet. Food eaten in secret is delicious. You remember chapter 6 and 7 where the fallen woman, the woman who was running away from her husband, using his wealth and inviting the young man in. He's coming back to that similar type thing and saying, look, come in here. You don't have to do it the wise way. That's a cheat way to get you there. You can and I can enjoy all these wonderful things. And you look at that and you say, wow, this is great. But how much candy would you put in your basket if it had this warning attached? Can you see that? Let me read it for you. It's a small print, but it always is when lawyers put stuff on. The contents of these sweets have been laced with arsenic. Would you fill your basket? Would you say, give me $10 more of that? You see, that's the situation of wisdom's banquet. It's, it's holy, it's pure, but folly's banquet, verse 18 says, little do they know that the dead are there. And that her guests are deep in the realms of the dead. They don't recognize that. They don't understand there's death in the way of folly. It's easier to be foolish. It's easier to come to church and let me tell you something and then go away and never think about it anymore. Do you, do you ever think about why we're insisting this time that you work on memory verses? Because it's hard to memorize. It's tough to memorize. It's tough to really think about and understand those words. But you see, wisdom is not found in collecting a three by four card set of Proverbs. Wisdom is found when Proverbs go through your mind. 
and adjust your thinking. You see, the wisdom is not so much in the text as it's got to be up here. God says, I will use this wisdom. Solomon is saying to his son and saying to the sons in Israel, if you will imbibe, if you will work with me, if you'll listen and think about it, if you'll consider this strange saying I am putting forth to you and really think about what it means, I will train your mind to wisdom. I will direct your heart so that your feet and your hands do the right thing so that you receive the blessing of wisdom. Instead of the pain and disgrace of folly. Look back at verse 10 and 11 as we close. Where do you start? Right here. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Literally that word there, it's the place where you start. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For through wisdom... Your days will be many and years will be added to your life. If you are wise, your wisdom will reward you. And if you are a mocker, you alone will suffer. Where do we start? We start here. We start with, I really want to know God in his wisdom. And I want to live my life accordingly. Let me tell you, young people. If you will seek out the wisdom of God in chapters 10 through 22 with us. Let me tell you, parents, if you will really study and think about what it is saying, if you will try to grasp what he is doing and how he is putting these Proverbs together and thinking about what they mean, it will pay off benefits all the days of your life, in your life and in the lives of your children. And it will pass from your children to your grandchildren to your great-grandchildren. Because that wisdom, that knowledge, that ideas of here's what's really going on in the world will stand you in good stead. If you'll put forth the effort. There is a proverb that I have skipped in the presentation. The sluggard, I love this one. It's very graphic. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish but he will not bring it to his mouth if you're that kind of learner you're going to bury your hand in the dish every Sunday but you won't bring it to your mouth to chew on it to memorize it to think about it you're a lazy person and you'll get a lazy person's reward Nothing wrong with burying your hand in the dish. But bring it to your mouth and learn wisdom. Now, why do I tell you that? Not just because there's tremendous benefit there. I've been in chapters 10 through 22. I've been through it several times. It's tough. You don't have to work at it. I'm struggling, working at it. Uh, I think... I'm beginning to get a handle on it. I got a handle on the first couple of pieces that I'm going to be presenting next Sunday and a few Sundays after that as we begin to getting into it. But I'm telling you, it's tough. Chris has nearly passed out in chapters 10, verses 1 to 5 in his studies. I'm telling you, it's tough. But as the fog begins to clear, and you begin to see how this fits together, you recognize it's not just a long string of unrelated proverbs. Repetition of things. Well, I know that. You begin to recognize, no, this proverb is saying something different than this one. It's not contrary necessarily, but it's adding something. If I got this back here in this context, this one over here, I'm telling you, it takes work. But if you work at it, you'll get it. And your life will be changed forever. And you will change the lives of generations to come. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, what a marvel your word is. Lord, I've been studying your word for myself for 35 or 40 years. And I'm constantly amazed at the things that are there that I've missed before. 
Lord, I pray that you'll work in the hearts of every person in this room. That we will not rest until we have your wisdom in our life. Your thoughts in our minds. And Lord, that we so desire to know you as the Holy One. That we are repulsed by even the suggestion of sin upon us. That's what we want. We want to be pure and holy as you are. Lord, you have granted us your word in a language we can understand. Lord, help us to go ahead and to benefit from it by making it our study through these next few months. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.